Hey folks, Sonic fan here, doing a little review and rundown of this device, which is the Kerpu Portable Spot Welder, part of my never-ending quest to point out engineering flaws and improve upon them, because folks keep making mistakes in consumer products, and it makes my life challenging sometimes. In the case of this device, I really, really needed this to spot weld a battery recently, and it wouldn't do it. Uh, even with the recommended 0.12 millimeter nickel strips. I think I was actually using 0.1. I think it was 0.12. But um, it didn't work. It was very frustrating. And I've only had this thing for, I don't know, 10 months. I've used it like three times. So I was disappointed to say the least. It cost over 70 bucks. And, uh, well, when something stops working... It's time to take it apart and figure out what went wrong and how to fix it and make it better. So I'll give a little quick rundown of the pros of why I like this, the things that I do like about this, which are few, to be honest. And then I'm gonna give a rundown of the cons, which are essentially, there. there is a mix between engineering flaws and sort of cost reduction, uh, cost saving decisions that were made. So let's start off with what I like about it. Uh, attractive box, nice, beefy welding probes. These are really nice, solid, they feel like they're solid copper. Uh, really nice lug terminals. These are, these are great. Um, comes with a nail file that actually works quite well for cleaning the, uh, the spot welds. USB-C. It's nice to have things that are USB-C. I resisted it for a while, but uh, they have these new uh, connectors that are actually quite robust. And um, what else could you say about it? Circuit board, it's good quality. I can't knock the actual quality of the circuit board and the components that I see on here. Again, you got these good solder lug terminals. You've got a nice, good quality USB-C connector and um, you know, big chunky MOSFETs. Uh, everything looks like the solder that was used was good quality. You can see they have, they've got some exposed copper planes for the high current paths, and that's good to do. Um, the battery itself, at least on visual appearance, looks decent, and it's got these very heavy duty, you know, extra, you know, a lot of extra metal with uh, these little Allen bolts that go through it to really give it a good contact. It does have a built in thermistor, which is an absolute must. Um, it's actually soldered. Two wires are soldered to the board right there. And I guess this is a pro and a con. It's got this heavy duty, really heavy duty aluminum case. Um, at least I think it's aluminum. Maybe it's some, some other material. Uh, so those are the pros. Okay. What are the cons? Well, Con number one, is it broken less than a year, of course. How did it break? Well, it runs, even though it's com it comes in this massive case, which would make you think it has a massive battery, it doesn't. And in fact, uh, you have double the battery size in just foam, you know, which nice to protect it. But if you have this huge, you know, really powerful thick metal case, you don't need the foam, Pat. You don't need that in there. Not, this isn't gonna. This isn't gonna warp. <laughs> if you drive a truck over it, maybe. Uh, so you know, a little bit feeling like I was slighted as a as a customer there because it's empty space for you know half the battery size, uh, and because the battery is quite small, it's actually running at four volts, four point two. You know, nominal for lithium polymer. Uh, it essentially isn't my my my. Uh, my guess, my educated guess here is it's not giving out enough current to successfully do a spot weld. It tries, but it's not enough current. And that is because this is the number one flaw of this device. It was engineered too close to spec. So what the engineers probably did was they figured, oh, okay, this much current will, will spot weld, you know, a 0.12 millimeter nickel strip. And this kind of a battery will do that. And they didn't do any sort of longevity testing. They didn't do any sort of calculations or maybe they did it's all planned obsolescence i should hope not but it doesn't look like they did any calculations for you know what's what's the life cycle of this battery how long is this thing going to last um 
because, you know, like I said, I've used this like three times. I've kept it, you know, I keep my batteries in top shape. I always charge them. I don't let them, uh, you know, sit at peak voltages. I don't let them sit at reduced voltages. I keep them in that, you know, 70% charge range. This never, ever went to zero, never even went close to zero. And so it's been stored in optimal conditions, you know, kind of like 65 degrees. I guess I could have stored it in the fridge. That's actually optimal temperature for, for polys. But uh, it's been it's been babied. It's been kept in really good shape, and it just stopped working. So that's that's the number one con. Uh, number two is they used these elongated shaft tactile push buttons. If you've seen my videos of this sort before, you know that I absolutely hate these, and I always criticize them. Um, and I'll show you why. You have, if you look at the inside of a tactile push button. Which is, which is this guy, you'll see you have a center contact and you have two contacts on the side. And how these work is you have a conical disc and uh, like so, it goes in there. And then this, there's a plastic actuator that hits the middle of the disc and reverses the shape. And that's what gives you uh, contacts across the the various points. That's all fine and nice, but when your actuator shaft is long like this, and you'll see the point, the very small point there, which actually hits the conical disc, is it is inevitable that this will be slightly angled in various ways on the disc. Now this is reduced by the fact that they did use a solid metal cutout for that button, so it might not be too bad in this case, but I absolutely hate using these. I feel like people should never use them really ever. Like if you need to have a long shafted tactile push button, what you should do is use one of the standard DTS-6s, which are the really short, you know, the actuator is only about that that high. And then just, just engineer your case to have a longer shaft to depress it. Um, and that way you can actuate the full head of the tactile push button and not that one little pivot point, which can be angled. So this might seem like a nitty gritty thing. It is such a common source of failure in electronics. I absolutely, absolutely uh, cringe when I see these being used. Uh, and then you've got another you've got another button down here. And so let me explain the, the functionality. You've got three buttons. One is you hold is a, is a soft start, you know, hold it down to turn it on. The second one sets your power level. And I believe this one also sets your mode. Once you turn it on, you can click it to change mode between manual and auto. When it's in auto mode, as soon as the two probes touch, it does a spot weld. When it's in manual mode, you have to press this button to do a spot weld. This is a pretty terrible design. Uh, first of all, if you've got this in a case, uh, and I shouldn't say it's a terrible design, it's, it's a terrible execution of this design. Uh, so first off, this button here is, you're never, how are you gonna reach that when you're holding probes, right? Um, what I would have really liked to see is this button actually be a breakout cable. Maybe that would have cost too much. Um, at the very least, it should have been on top of the unit, not on the front, on this side here. Um, that makes it extremely hard to press because you're just pushing the case back. At least if you're pushing down, you're pushing it down to the ground. Maybe it's a safety thing. Who knows? Um, they could have made it a touch sensor, but maybe that would have been a safety thing too uh, and a cost thing. But in any case, the location, I never can use the manual mode, even though I want to. Now, why would I want to use the manual mode? Well, because the automatic mode was programmed poorly. The automatic mode has the spot weld happening within half a second. I haven't timed it exactly, but it's within like 250 to 500 milliseconds, I would say. Uh, I don't think it's even a second. Again, I haven't timed it. But the point is, it's too brief of a window for you to get your welding probes on there in a good location. Because what you'll notice, let me refocus my camera here. What you might notice here, if we look at our probes, is they are flat tipped, right? And so for one, they're also, I wish these would have been a little more narrow. Now I don't know enough about welding that maybe there's a reason, there's probably a good reason that they're not super narrow because the, the tips might char or get burned from, from the excessive current. Could be reasons. But one thing is these these being so fat, <laughs> these probes, it's hard to get in here. And so if you're trying to get into a spot weld on a battery, right, it, you might not even be able to do straight down. Um, I, I definitely try to, but sometimes you might even need to angle it a bit. 
Um, although you should probably go straight down. But even if you're going straight down, um, by the time you're pressing it and you're trying to, you know, apply the slight bit of pressure that you need to make contact or whatever it is, it's already spot welding. It's already actuating it. And you're just like, ah, oh, can you give me a second? And because the manual mode is so hard to use, um, you know, that makes that a problem too. Now, this is not the reason it wasn't working, but it's just an additional headache. Um, so there's that. It's a big problem. Um, and so what they should have done is made the, the, the length of time programmable. I think if you spend more money, you can get one that's program programmable or just make it like two or three seconds. Like, is anybody really trying to spot weld so fast that they can't wait two seconds? Like, come on. Uh, so I don't know what they made it. They made it for like some sort of assembly line sweatshop, you know, time frame or whatever. And it's, it's not why people are buying this. I, I highly doubt that. And even if they were, uh, again, I don't think a half a second would have made any difference. The other, and so that leads me to the other huge engineering problem. Um, if you're doing a, a discharge rate that quickly for your spot welds, then the only reason you could be doing that is because you want people to spot weld really fast, like in a sweatshop assembly line. But if you're doing that, even in that unsavory scenario, uh, you need to have a, something that can handle, uh, really fast discharge rates and recharge really fast at the same time, which is not a lithium polymer battery. What you would need is a capacitor, a big chunky capacitor. Really, 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 really should be in here. And for the life of me, I don't know why they didn't include a capacitor. You can see there's no large capacitors in here. And maybe I'll find this out later in my testing. Uh, feel free to leave a note if you think you know why they did not include a capacitor. Why the hell would you not have a capacitor in a portable spot welder? Um, capacitors, this is what they're really good for. High discharge rates, fast recharge rates. It's why, it's why you use very large capacitors in car subwoofer systems. They can handle those, those instantaneous peak discharges. That's what they're meant for. This is not what batteries are meant for. Granted, they work well for the purpose most of the time, but it's not their primary use case scenario. It is exactly the primary use case scenario of large capacitors like this. Um, so that's insane. I don't know why they didn't do that. I'm guessing it's a cost saving thing. I don't know. But um, without a capacitor in here, if you're trying to do quick spot welds, it's just gonna tax the battery enormously. And it's almost like a planned obsolescence thing because the battery is not going to be able to handle those continuous discharges if you're spot welding, you know, even once every couple of seconds, three, four, five seconds. Uh, whereas if you had a capacitor, this is going to recharge and discharge and, and pump out that current a lot more effectively without, without really taxing this, this polymer battery. Um, and then I'll say this case, I think was a terrible design. Why would you need this big heavy metal case when uh, turns out it's not even heat synced to anything. If you look at these white lines here on the silk, this is where it makes contact with the metal case. Uh, at no other point, from what I could tell, does it make contact with the metal case other than this foam padding on the battery. So for that reason, uh, th the case doesn't get warm at all during use. The probes do, the case doesn't. Um, so what the heck? Why bother? Uh, is it like a marketing thing? It looks cool? I don't know. Uh, it, it makes it sturdier, I guess, for the polymer battery, but it also makes it heavier, more expensive, and a lot more expensive. Those cases are not cheap to manufacture. So uh, maybe they're going the Apple thing where they're trying to like, you know, be showy or something. I don't know. But uh, that that is crap. Um, you've got a nice uh, little buzzer in here that gives you a notice when it's spot welding, so that's fine. It is kind of odd that it's angled here because they didn't make uh, proper space on the board for it. Um, it actually goes on top of, a, of an IC over here. A little bit of solder on it. Um, and then uh, you've got these LEDs. All you have is LEDs to indicate like power levels and stuff like that, which I guess does the job, you know, if you're trying to make it budget, I guess. They have ones with screens that you can get for more money. But if it was me, I would have opted to get rid of the, the super expensive case. I would have put on a $3 screen instead. I would have... Uh, Instead of having these three buttons that kind of suck, I would have liked to have a rotary encoder and or a breakout UI board. Um, maybe that would have been too expensive, but at least uh, a standard DTS-6 uh, push button uh, engineered properly for longevity would have been nice. And having the manual button actually be on the face and not on the front 
that's a, that's a no brainer. Uh, and uh, if you were going to use a metal case, heat sink it too. Maybe they didn't want to like run the risk of a of a of a spot weld, you know. But then again, the case is also insulated. I don't know, man. I don't know what that was all about. Um, also, not a huge fan of the separation between the positive and negative terminals. Look at that. That is the space between there. Now, granted, it's an enclosed case, yada yada, but look at that. You have this big metal bar here. That's metal. Uh, that is a very, very, very small amount of space when you're when you're going to have something delivering. Well, according to this. 650 amps of output current <laughs> of course it's not uh and to do a, a nickel strip i think is 150 amps which this isn't successfully doing but in any case um you know potential for arcing maybe um why the heck they didn't use some of this foam between the two battery terminals or some sort of insulator uh is beyond me because that's that's a no-brainer so uh Anyway, I'll stop lampooning this poor thing. Uh, engineering flaws, folks. Uh, they abound in your consumer electronics. Um, oh, and I forgot to say the thing that was the most painful about this was actually taking it apart. Um, they really didn't want people inside this thing and how this was engineered. And again, I don't think this is a great idea. Uh, and maybe in their sense it is because it was hard to take apart. But this goes in here and then the, uh, the buttons pop up through the two holes and then these aluminum stoppers are under the board and the battery. And you have to take a flathead and a hammer and hammer these stupid things out. And it really sucked. And uh, the trick, by the way, though, if you want to do it, is you have to start from this side, where the warranty sticker is. You hammer both of those to take the two smaller bits out from under the board. You pull those out with, with pliers and some good force. Um, but then the board still doesn't fall down because it's the idea is it holds the board up. So it still won't fall down after you do that. What you'll then have to do is um, take the two smaller bits. I think it's the smaller ones. And then you have to like get this one in here and then hammer it to get the other two out because they separated them. These all should have just been one piece, but they're two pieces makes it especially a nightmare to get into this thing but i'm into it now and so okay those are my critiques um i'll do a second part video since this one's been a, long, a little bit long-winded uh of what my upgrade ideas are but hopefully this was interesting to folks sega sonic fan signing out